My name is William. I am a 27-year-old photographer with no real claim to fame. My older brother Richard, who was five years my senior, got me into photography. To be honest, making ends meet takes up all my energy, and I can't even think about starting a family. My parents passed away in a tragic accident when I was in high school. Ever since then, it's just been Richard and me. I like to think that we have a deeper bond than most siblings. But Richard passed away three years ago as well. William, I've decided to get married. That's what he told me four years ago, when he introduced me to a woman named Linda. She seemed very calm and gentle, a perfect fit for kind-hearted Richard. However, Richard didn't want a big wedding ceremony, perhaps because he had lost our parents. They had a private ceremony overseas, so I never got to know Linda's family or friends. I sometimes wonder if things would have turned out differently if I had known more about her social circle. About a year after Richard got married, I got an abrupt call from him. I've got one month to live. Are you joking? That's not funny, you know? After losing our parents, Richard was the only family I had left. I was furious that Richard would make such a horrible joke, but his tone remained steady. It's terminal cancer. It spread everywhere, and there's nothing that can be done. No way. My hands started shaking so badly I almost dropped my phone. Holding back tears, I struggled to continue the conversation. I wanted to keep my promise to you. Well, you can't go breaking it now, can you? That's all I could say before hanging up, my phone slipping through my hands as I fell to my knees and broke down in tears. Three months later, Richard joined our parents. Although he was given just one month, he had held on for three. At his funeral, I couldn't hold back the tears, crying openly. Linda acted strong, and there I was, so utterly pathetic. Years have passed, and I'm still not over Richard's death. We had promised to keep on living, and I could only get through our parents' death because I had him. Now, I'm as lonely as a cloud. I don't even have anyone to talk to about family. I inherited some of Richard's estate, but I can't bring myself to touch the money. I have most of Richard's belongings as keepsakes, but I'm not emotionally ready to look at them. Two years seem much shorter than I thought they would be. And now the anniversary memorial for Richard is upon us. I tell myself that I need to move on, deciding to face life head on after the ceremony is over. Then Linda stops me. She dropped a bombshell with a smile on her face. This will be the last time we gather for the memorial service. Please don't contact me anymore. Wait, what do you mean? Since Richard is gone, there is no reason for us to stay connected. Uh, you mean... I mean, let's cut ties. It's better for the both of us. Linda said that and laughed. It's only been two years. I wanted to say that, but the words wouldn't come out. Sure, Linda is still young and might want to remarry. I get that, but still, something feels off. I couldn't wrap my head around it feeling uneasy as I ended the anniversary memorial and went home. Alone, I sighed. I decided to move on after the anniversary memorial, but it seems I'm not ready yet. Were Linda's words sincere? And why did she say them with a smile? Well, it is what it is. I thought about it, but couldn't figure it out. I just went to sleep. A week later, I was still feeling unresolved and started to get irritated with myself. I need a drink tonight. I decided to head to the bar where Richard and I used to go. Walking downtown, I saw a familiar woman walk by. It was Linda, arm in arm with another man. She looked different, not the demure Linda I knew, but one that fit the vibrant nightlife. Not that it's any of my business, but this bothered me even more. When I got to the bar, there were no other customers, perhaps because it was still early. William, long time no see. 
Being one of the few who knew about Richard and me, I started venting to the bartender. At the end he said, You know, if you keep grieving like this, it would make your brother sad too. Hearing it in such a gentle tone made me cry. From that day on, I managed to face forward. The next day, I opened a box containing Richard's photography equipment that I had kept as a memento. This is the most important thing. Inside was the camera Richard had always used. I had wanted it when Linda said she did and had asked for it as a favor. I had opened the box several times to air it out, but picking it up and using it felt like admitting Richard was really gone, so I hadn't been able to. Now I finally picked it up and felt its weight. I'll be using Richard's prized camera from now on. Richard's not here anymore, so we can't take new photos together. In that sense, the promise to publish a photo book together will never be fulfilled. But any photo taken with this camera will feel like it was taken with him. I carefully unpacked the box and started arranging its contents one by one. As I pulled the camera out of its case, something else fell out along with it. Picking it up, I realized it was a letter addressed to me. It had been folded multiple times, probably to disguise it as something else and tucked into the camera case. Upon unfolding it, it was addressed to William, and the contents revealed information I'd never heard before, suggesting it was written after a terminal diagnosis. It said that I was listed as the beneficiary for a life insurance policy, and advised me to verify it, as the wife might have changed the beneficiary. I later found out this insurance policy had been in place since my high school days, back when we lived together. A surprisingly large sum had been set aside, apparently with the thought that I'd be in trouble if something happened to him. I hadn't claimed any of the insurance money. Could Linda have? I know nothing about Linda's social circle. I could ask her directly, but I hesitate to contact her now. Still, it would be wrong to ignore Richard's wishes. I decided to honor his intentions and dial Linda's number, which I had yet to delete. Who is this? The voice that answered was lethargic and not the Linda I knew. Nevertheless, I began to speak. Linda? It's me, William. Huh? Didn't I say to stop contacting me? She seemed like a completely different person. But then it struck me. This might be the real her. Let's cut to the chase. You committed insurance fraud, didn't you? What are you talking about? You claimed Richard's life insurance, right? Life insurance? Of course, I'm his wife. Why shouldn't I? The policy was supposed to be in my name. What? That's not true. I claimed it, so I am the beneficiary. What is this? You short on cash or something? This confirmed my suspicions about her true nature and I had been completely blind to it. But did Richard see it after they got married? Naturally, a spouse would be the beneficiary after marriage. Maybe you were before we got married, but I was the beneficiary when he passed. Now, I can live comfortably thanks to that. Her laughter irked me. Stop missing around. What do you think of Richard? That's none of your business. It was a matter between spouses. Don't contact me again. I looked at the screen of my phone after she hung up and sighed. A month later, Linda appeared before me, just as I'd expected. Long time no see, William. Before me stood the Linda I first met. Remarkable how people can change. What do you want? I replied, clearly annoyed. So, there are other things left behind by him, right? I have a right to those two, don't I? Ah. Are you talking about the photo book? Yes, royalties. I have a right to receive some too, don't I? What? Why? Because I was his wife, that's why. To give you the backstory, this all began some time after Richard passed away. Sitting before me is Brown, from the publishing house. Brown had known Richard for a long time and came to me with the idea of creating a photo book from our collected works. 
He had the data from the camera Richard used, and they had been in discussions about it. However, when Richard died, the project stalled. Then after reading a letter Richard had sent from the hospital, Brown decided he wanted to complete the photo book. Of course, I was all in. Richard and I had always promised to someday publish our work together. Whether it sold well or not wasn't the issue. We just wanted to leave something tangible behind. So we went ahead and published it. To be frank, the book by two unknown artists didn't sell. I continued my modest lifestyle until one day, everything changed. Brown contacted me to say that our book had suddenly become popular online. Is it possible that a photo book from two years ago becomes a hot topic? I had my doubts about this, but when I looked it up on the internet, I found that the photo book was indeed a hot topic. A well-known influencer had praised it on social media and the posts had gone viral. The book's newfound fame also secured the publication of another photo book, elevating me to a full-fledged photographer. And that's when Linda, eyeing the royalties, showed up at my door. This is where my counter-attack begins. That book was something Richard and I wanted to publish. I don't want you tainting it. Just go away. Don't give me that idealistic talk. The royalties are split, right? That means I have the right to some. It's clear her only interest is in the money. I am furious. What does she think Richard meant to her? We had cut ties and yet here she is making demands. Let's talk about the insurance money instead. Insurance money? Can we not? That's not important right now. It is important, but fine. Let's stick to the photo book. That was self-published, so there are no royalties. However, my new book is bringing in lots of royalties. What? What are you talking about? There is no money for you to take. Moreover, you're facing fraud charges over the insurance money. What will you do? I didn't commit any fraud. Are you still going on about that? What about the $300,000 you received? Your name was on it, but she interrupts me. So, it's my money. But Richard changed that just before he passed. I can get handwriting analysis results anytime. I am done beating around the bush. Linda's face visibly changes as I get to the point. H handwriting analysis? You started looking into the insurance money when Richard was hospitalized. You found out that I was the beneficiary. If Richard were to pass away, you would get nothing. So you changed the beneficiary without Richard's permission. Linda backs away, her face pale. I show no mercy. Richard left me a letter. He must have seen through you changing the recipient on your own. That's why I had a handwriting analysis done. I have all the evidence I need. You must be mistaken about something. You knew about Richard's insurance policy, didn't you? and got blinded by the payout. Richard's letter mentioned that your personality changed dramatically after the insurance money became a topic. Linda glares at me, but doesn't say a word. You hardly talked about anything else with Richard once you found out, huh? You knew he didn't have much time left and only saw dollar signs. You underestimated Richard. Cut the crap. That's not... it's not like that. What's different, then? Richard tried to divorce you, but you dodged the conversations. Eventually, Richard was left helpless. The only reason Richard didn't tell me while he was alive is that he still wanted to believe you weren't like that. You betrayed that trust. I bet you'd have changed your lifestyle and even became flashy the moment you got that insurance money. That's cruel to say. Linda tries to retort, but she's lost her spirit. So, can I sue you? Insurance fraud is serious business. But I won't, if you pay it all back. Pay it all back? I've already spent nearly a hundred thousand dollars. What am I supposed to do? It seems Linda has admitted to her guilt. But where did she spend such a large sum in such a short time? So you finally admit it. What's your next move? I witness the color draining from Linda's face for the first time as she collapses on the spot. I get it. I'll find a way. 
to pay it all back. Later, I received the full $300,000. Linda sold all the luxury items she had bought with the insurance money. Apparently, she mainly squandered it on some guy and couldn't prepare much. She ended up going to her parents for help. Her father called to apologize, saying they'd cover the rest. Linda now works from dawn to dusk under her parents' watchful eyes to repay them. As for me, I've secured a book deal and royalties are coming in. I'm thriving as a photographer. All thanks to Richard. My name is Rachel. I married my husband John three years ago, and we've been living happily ever since. Both of us work hard, so we live comfortably, spending our days off on trips and having fun together. And now, there's a new life growing inside me. My belly isn't noticeable yet, but the baby is almost at 13 weeks. I was hoping to announce the news to everyone once I got to my second trimester. My life was complete with my beloved husband and our cute baby on the way. We're not particularly wealthy, but we manage a decent living, and I would say people may consider us to be couple goals. But there's one thing that bothers me. It's my husband's sister, my sister-in-law. I just can't get along with her. My in-laws are really nice people and have treated me like a real daughter since we first met. But my sister-in-law didn't like that and started making snide remarks about me. Even at our wedding, she complained about the food and embarrassed the staff and kept asking me, How much did you spend on this? It's John's money, isn't it? You could have at least kept it a couple of notches down. <laughs> Saying that, she only made sarcastic remarks to me. She clearly doesn't like me and behaves like that every time we meet. Because I don't meet my sister-in-law that often and it's just a matter of putting up with her once in a while. I kept telling myself that it's okay. However, she started to stay at our house very often. She got married before us and has a daughter who just turned four. She and her husband always liked to travel and now that their daughter is a bit older, they've started to travel a lot in the past two years and they always stay at our house the night before their trips. It's true that our apartment is just 20 minutes by car from the airport. Even though they could just head straight to the airport instead of coming to our place, they always spend the night at our house before departing for their trip the next day. At first, I didn't mind, but it's starting to become a regular occurrence, and I really don't like it. My sister-in-law's family always shows up unannounced, ringing up our intercom. Hey Rachel, we're here! It happened again while I was having dinner with my husband. In a hurry, I asked John, did you know they were coming today? He shook his head in response. Hey Rachel, open up! That loud yell from the other side of the front door left me with no choice but to open it. Oh, we haven't had dinner yet. Can you fix something? With that, she sat down at the seat where I had been sitting just a moment ago. Beside her, my sister-in-law's husband and their daughter took their seat. There's no excuse us for intruding. No, sorry for the sudden visit. Not even, uh, can we have something to eat? Nothing at all. They just come over as if it's their own place, hang around, and treat me like their housekeeper. I really hated that. Despite my feelings, I cooked and entertained my sister-in-law's family, only to be told, Rachel, isn't the food a bit bland today? Could you pass me the salt? And with that, she made another request without even trying to get it herself. I've asked John a few times to help me out, but he just says, I'm tired from work, and just drinks beer with my sister-in-law's husband. Normally, I have no complaints about my husband, but I hate it when he does this. My sister-in-law's family eats dinner with us, drinks, and makes a huge mess without even offering to clean up. One day, unable to bear it anymore, I said to John, Can you ask your sister to refrain from coming so abruptly? It's difficult for me to prepare food in a rush and clean up after their mess. But John just said, But it's not like they're here every day. They only come over sometimes, before a trip, right? 
Don't be so mean. And so he dismissed me. Even after that, I pleaded him several times, but he never listened. During those days of feeling helpless, I found out I was pregnant. John was very happy about my pregnancy and even accompanied me to the hospital. He helped carry the groceries. We read parenting books together. But still, he never says anything to his sister and her family. Just the other day, knowing very well that I've been unable to carry on with my regular day due to morning sickness, my sister and her family are coming over today. He casually told me. Wait, what? I can barely function right now. I can't cook a full meal. And honestly, it's much better for me to just lie down. When I said that, he responded with a smile. You don't have to force yourself. We have beer. Just prepare some snacks. My husband, grinning as he said this. I can't just lay down while his sister and her family are here. Why can't he understand that? Even if it's just snacks, we don't usually keep ready-to-eat meals at home, so I have no choice but to prepare something, however simple it may be. He should be able to figure that out if he gave it some thought. After that, I tried several times to negotiate with my husband to decline their visit, but all he said was, My sister's already on their way here. It's too late now. He would just say that. I had no choice but to prepare some snacks while not feeling well and went to bed early. But in the end, I was woken up by my sister-in-law's loud voices and couldn't sleep at all. And I have to go to work tomorrow. I thought about this, but in this situation, I couldn't even tell my husband to be quiet, so I endured it somehow. The next day, it seemed like my sister-in-law's family was leaving early for their trip, so they started preparing around 4 a.m. Their loud voices and bustling activity woke me up involuntarily. Then they came into my room uninvited and said, Sorry Rachel, could you give us a ride to the station? They even went so far as to ask that. Um, but I'm still in my pajamas and I haven't even put on my makeup. I have work today. You can prepare when you come back. We came by train and we'll be late if we wait for the bus. Please, hurry up. Being talked to like that, I got really mad. I went to wake up my husband and said, John, can you please drive your sister? But all he did was moan and refuse to get up. No matter how much I shook him or called his name, he stubbornly refused to wake up. Seeing this, my sister-in-law, unable to bear it, said, Rachel, hurry up! We're going to miss our flight! And she started yelling at me. I had no choice but to drive my sister-in-law to the airport, and when I got home, my husband had already left for work. There were dishes from what seemed to be his own breakfast left in the sink, and I thought he didn't prepare anything for me, and I felt sad. Two months later, when my belly started having a noticeable bump, I had some leftover paid time off, so I decided to cut work off in the morning and go home. That's when I noticed a voicemail message on our home phone. When I played it back, it was a message from my sister-in-law saying, Hey Rachel, it's me. I'll be coming over again this evening. Thanks. Hearing that, I thought, if I stay, I'll just be used as a maid again. And I hurriedly packed my things. I decided to tell my husband that I had something to do and was going back to my parents' house. With that thought, I was about to leave with just the bare essentials when an idea came to me. I left the bags I had prepared at the entrance and checked the contents of the pantry. Just yesterday, I used up all the groceries, so there's almost nothing left in the fridge. There was only one frozen pasta left in the freezer, but I gathered all the instant ramen and a few ready-to-eat meals I had kept for emergencies took them all, and went back to my parents' house. A few hours after arriving at my parents' house, I got a call from my husband. Rachel, my sisters are coming today, you know. Where are you? They said they left a voice message. A voice message? I don't think there was any. Plus, I got called back to my parents' house because I have things to do. I'm staying overnight and I'll be back tomorrow. Upon hearing this, my husband's mood turned sour. So, what am I supposed to do about dinner? My sisters are coming, and there's nothing in the fridge. He started to panic. But it was none of my business. 
Why don't you discuss it with your sisters? Oh, my dad's calling me. Gotta go. Hey, wait. Rachel! Ignoring my husband, I hung up the phone and set it to silent mode. Actually, there was no truth to being called back home. But if I had stayed at our house, I would have had to put up with the same unpleasant experiences, as always. I couldn't bear to stay at home thinking that, so I had to leave. That day, I ate the meal my mother had cooked for the first time in a long time, got a good night's sleep, and the next day, I went shopping with my parents for children's clothes. When I remembered to check my phone, there were multiple calls and messages from my husband. Among them were messages blaming me for the hard time he had. I was incredibly upset and angry. Then, I sent an email to my husband. I'll be bringing my parents back with me tonight. I think we'll get there in the evening. Could you please clean up the room? Oh, and Dad said he wants to have a drink with you, so please prepare some snacks. Then, I put my phone away and enjoyed the precious time with my parents. Around 7 p.m., I arrived home with my parents. My husband looked noticeably thinner, even though I hadn't seen him in just one day. The house was not completely cleaned up, and there was garbage scattered in places. Good to see you, Mom and Dad. I'm sorry, my sisters came yesterday, and the room is a mess. He said apologetically to my parents. Don't worry, you didn't expect us to come. My parents calmed him down, saying this. I made some quick snacks with my mom and served them to my husband and dad. So, your sisters came yesterday. Must have been tough, huh? My dad asked my husband. Then John opened his mouth and began talking about how hard he had had it. When my sister-in-laws realized there was nothing at home, they got in a bad mood and said, Order us something already. Apparently, they had John order whatever they wanted, like pizza and sushi. On top of that, they made John go to the convenience store alone to buy drinks, alcohol, and snacks. When the delivery arrived, they demanded money from John. He told me he spent about $180 just yesterday. My sister-in-law's kids are still small, so it can't be helped, but she always makes a mess after eating. However, neither my sister-in-law nor her husband say anything. I had pointed it out before, but they said, Can you not interfere with our stuff? Ever since then, I haven't said a word. John had never done any preparation or cleaning whenever the sister-in-laws came over, which is why experiencing this firsthand, what I always do, finally made him realize how hard it was. He told my dad, I even had to take care of my sister's kid and give her a bath. I also had to prepare their beds. I was really exhausted. When John was talking to my dad like that, he seemed really small. My dad just listened to John's story silently. When John finished talking, he asked, It sounds tough. I heard from Rachel as well that your sisters visit quite often. Is that right? In which John replied. On the other hand, Yes, that's right. I've always left it all to Rachel, so I didn't realize how hard it was. I've decided to firmly refuse them from now on. And then he turned to me and said, Rachel, I am really sorry. I didn't realize it was this hard. I'll definitely say no to my sisters. My dad just smiled warmly, looking at me. And I subtly gestured to my dad, trying not to let John notice. Yes, this was all part of the plan. I had talked to my parents about my sister-in-laws when I went back home. My dad suggested that I should go and put John in the same position. As a result, John understood how hard I've been having it and had him promise to firmly say no to his sister's visit. Everything was going as I had planned, so I secretly pumped my fist in joy. The next day, John contacted my sister-in-law and said, Sis, I'm sorry, but please stop coming over to our place. It's too much for us to have you over, and we've had a hard time. He said that and refused to have her family over in the future. My sister-in-law and her husband were angry and kept coming over, but John never opened the door. Furthermore, John said, I'm sure my sisters won't give up and will keep coming. 
he suggested moving. With our baby on the way, we decided to move to a larger apartment. Of course, we're keeping this a secret from my sister-in-law and her husband. We spoke to John's parents about the situation and asked them not to disclose our new address to my sister-in-law's family. Since then, they have stopped coming over. In fact, our interaction with my sister-in-law's family has significantly decreased. We're relieved that we no longer have to deal with them. A few months later, we were blessed with a daughter, and now we're living happily. During major holidays like Christmas and Thanksgiving, we do visit John's parents, which means we meet my sister-in-law's family, but we never reveal our address, no matter how much they ask. They've thrown fits and demanded our address multiple times, but John's parents scolded my sister-in-law for this behavior, so she stopped asking. I guess this is the right distance to keep. We've settled into this arrangement and have moved on with our lives. John has become more proactive in doing household chores and childcare ever since that incident. Even though he's working, he is supportive and involved in our daughter's upbringing. That incident must have had a real impact on him. In a way, I feel a bit grateful to sister-in-law's family for sparking this change in John but I'm keeping that thought to myself. For now, I plan to have John help out a lot more with housework and childcare. It was the day of a family dinner centered around my three months old son, Alexander. While everyone was enjoying their meal, my eight-year-old niece, Emma, was the only one not eating. Instead, she was intently watching Alexander Alexander was also staring back at Emma, moving his arms and legs. Seems like Alexander has something to say. Then Emma began to speak, and what she said was astonishing. My husband Michael's face turned pale and his lips trembling. Michael had been called out on a secret he thought only he knew. Seeing this, I decided to expose Michael's truth right then and there. I'm Jessica, a 25-year-old housewife. I married Michael who is three years older and works in an office two years ago. Despite the challenges of new motherhood, we were living a happy life as a family of three. My sister Sophia and her husband live nearby. Ever since I was pregnant, Sophia has been a great help, often coming over to assist with chores and keep me company. One day, Sophia told me something unbelievable. Her eight-year-old daughter, Emma, my niece, apparently has a mysterious power. Sophia recounted an incident when she and Emma were driving. Emma suddenly said, We should take another route. There will be an accident if we go this way. Sophia didn't understand why Emma would say such a thing, especially when the road ahead looked clear. But Emma looked so serious that Sophia decided to change routes. The next day, we learned from the news that a major accident had occurred on the road they were initially going to take. Sophia was horrified to think what might have happened if she had ignored Emma's warning. There were other instances too, like when Emma predicted a burglary in the neighbor's house, which actually happened. However, Sophia had warned the neighbors in advance, so they were able to evacuate with their valuables, avoiding any loss. I am not a fan of the occult, so I just found Sophia's stories creepy, and I didn't really believe Emma had any special powers. I told Michael about it, but he also brushed it off, saying, Well, strange things do happen. By the way, ever since I got pregnant, Michael started coming home late, often drunk. I wished he would help me with the baby or the housework, even just a little, but that never happened. He had promised to cool parent when we found out I was pregnant, but after the birth, he left all the child care to me. Finally home... Michael's drunken voice would wake up Alexander, who I had just put to sleep. Holding a crying Alexander, I told Michael, Please keep it down, you're waking Alexander, and can you please cut back on the drinking and come home earlier? Michael yelled back, I have work obligations, okay? You should be grateful you can live this way. Stop nagging me. His shouting woke Alexander again, who cried even louder this time. I was angry at Michael's words, but arguing with a drunk person was pointless. All I could do was put Alexander back to sleep. 
Two weeks later, Sophia and Emma came to visit on a day when Michael was home. Seeing Alexander for the first time, Emma said, He's so tiny and cute, and was completely enamored with the baby. But after a while, Emma started glancing at Michael. Curious, I asked. Emma, what's going on? Emma replied, Jessica, it looks like Alexander has something he wants to say. Looking at Alexander in his crib, he was staring at Emma. Then Emma said, This is a secret from Michael, and whispered something in my ear. Upon hearing it, I was so shocked that I lost my words and stared at Michael. Michael, who knew nothing, simply met my gaze. I said to Emma, But Alexander is just a baby. He can talk. Emma looked serious and said, It's true. He's saying he doesn't want to be away from mommy and to be careful around daddy. I couldn't believe what Emma was saying, but her earnest expression and teary eyes made me wonder. After Sophia and Emma left, I asked Michael, Do you have any secrets from me? Michael quickly replied, Why would you say that? Just asking. I have no secrets, you have nothing to worry about, Michael said. All right, I responded, but despite his words, Michael seemed anxious and his behavior was suspicious. Then he started doing something he never does, changing Alexander's diaper. This made me even more suspicious of him. Is Michael hiding something from me? I couldn't get what Emma had said out of my mind and I started to doubt Michael. The next day, after Michael left for work, Sophia and Emma suddenly showed up. Sophia apologized. Sorry for coming unannounced. Emma insisted on coming over. Emma's expression was dead serious. It's okay, don't apologize. Emma, welcome. Come on in. As I said this, Emma entered and lovingly gazed at Alexander, who was sleeping in his crib. But while I was preparing drinks in the kitchen, I noticed Emma staring intently at Michael's study. Emma, what's going on? I asked. Jessica, it's hidden here, Emma said, pointing at Michael's bookshelf. Upon closer inspection, I found a hidden diary and some documents tucked between the books. I had no idea Michael kept a diary, but curiosity got the better of me and I read it. The diary revealed a horrifying plan that Michael was secretly plotting. I couldn't believe he was capable of such thoughts. My hands were shaking and I thought maybe Emma's mysterious power was real. When I showed the diary to Sophia, she gripped my hand and said, It's okay, I'll protect you. Sophia then suggested, If you're worried, would it be okay if Emma and I come over when Michael is off work? Tears welled up in my eyes, and I felt reassured. Of course, Sophia, thank you. Emma looked up at us, concerned. I guess Emma's mysterious power is real. I'm sorry for doubting it before. Sophia smiled and said, I told you so, but it's good that we found out before anything serious happened. Thanks to Emma, right? Thank you. You're welcome, Emma said, blushing with a shy smile. I felt my love for Michael turning into resentment. I can't let this go. I'll investigate whether what Emma is saying is true, and if it is, I'll get back at him. I decided to confront Michael at a dinner party where both our parents would be present. From then on, Sophia and Emma would visit our home whenever Michael had a day off. At first, Michael was hospitable, but he gradually became irritable whenever Sophia and her family came over. Eventually, despite Sophia and Emma being there, Michael wanted to go out just with me. Sophia, can you watch Alexander while we go on a date? Michael asked, but Sophia declined. Michael, no can do. Alexander cries nonstop without Jessica around. Right, Alexander? Still, Michael persisted. Come on, I think Jessica needs a change of scenery too. Just getting some fresh air could be refreshing. True, but... Do we need to go out for that? Why not just dip into the garden and get some fresh air? The weather is nice today, it'll feel good. Sophia always managed to counter Michael's arguments without upsetting him, so he had nothing to say. From that point on, Michael became increasingly irritable. Finally, the day of the dinner party arrived. My parents, in-laws, and Sophia's family gathered to have a meal around Alexander. 
I was busy preparing the dishes I had cooked early in the morning. Look here, Alex. Ah, so cute. Michael was filming. Seeing this, my father-in-law murmured, Michael has become a fine father, and my mother-in-law nodded, tears in her eyes. Our son Alexander was also smiling, surrounded by everyone. Then the dinner party began. In the cheerful atmosphere, only Emma was staring at Alexander without eating. Alexander was also staring at Emma, moving his hands and feet. Sophia said to Emma, Here, your favorite apple juice. But Emma didn't respond. Just when I was wondering if Emma was sensing something again, she said to Michael, Do you love money more than Jessica? The room fell silent at Emma's words, and everyone froze, staring at her. Why would you say that, Emma? I asked. Because that's what Alexander was saying, Emma replied, pointing at him. I exchanged glances with Sophia, but everyone else was confused. Michael chuckled and said, Emma, Alexander can't talk yet. You shouldn't lie like that, lightly touching her head. Emma forcibly shook off his hand. It's not a lie. The baby says daddy is trying to push mommy from a high place to get money. You mean me? I would never do such a thing. Alexander loves mommy, so he's saying to stop being daddy. While everyone was shocked, only Michael turned pale and his lips began to tremble. Stop messing around. Don't say such ridiculous things. Suddenly, Michael slammed the table and yelled. Emma's face tightened and Alexander looked like he was about to cry. I wanted the dinner party to be pleasant, but that seemed impossible now. Michael had lost his temper at Emma's words before I could even bring up the topic. His reaction was like an admission of guilt. With a cold gaze, I confronted Michael. So, you've been cozying up to a woman you met at a club and inflating company expenses, haven't you? Michael looked flustered and said, What are you talking about? I thrust the diary I found on the bookshelf at him. It's all written here. Are you planning to deny it? That's about a subordinate at work. I would never do something so stupid. Sweat was forming on Michael's forehead. Reading someone's diary without permission is an invasion of privacy. I have no reason to be lectured by someone as low as you. What are you trying to say? Still playing dumb? You hatched a terrible plan to fix things before getting caught for embezzling, didn't you? I opened the diary to the page detailing the criminal plan and shoved it in his face. But Michael looked away. What is this? These are notes for a novel I thought of writing. Besides, a diary isn't evidence. Really? Then what do you say to this? I pulled out some documents. You know what this is, right? A life insurance policy you hid with a $100,000 payout on me. What were you planning? Michael started to panic. That is, you planned to kill me, collect the insurance money, and repay the embezzled funds. Isn't this solid proof? Stuck for words, Michael could only say, No. Emma had secretly told me this when she first met Alexander. Michael wants money and is planning to push you from a high place. From that moment, although I found it hard to believe, I started to suspect Michael. Both sets of parents were frozen in shock. Cornered, Michael had nothing to say and hung his head, but then suddenly fell to his knees clinging to my leg. Jessica, I'm sorry. Please pay back the money I used. Why should I? Michael looked like he was about to cry. Don't say that. We're married, right? Please, if the company finds out, I'll be fired. How will we live? Michael had trivialized my life for his own benefit. I deeply regretted ever being with such a person. I peeled off the clinging Michael and said, I can't be married to someone as horrifying as you. It's bad for Alexander, too, so let's get a divorce. I then thrust a pre-filled divorce application at him. I also demanded a $20,000 settlement and $500 a month in child support. No way! Alexander is still young. Paying that much money forever is a joke. Stop arguing and sign the divorce papers already. Michael was stomping on the ground and wailing like a child. 
His pathetic display made me feel nauseous. Then my father-in-law, who had been silent until now, shouted, Michael, enough is enough. He probably couldn't stand to see Alexander witnessing such disgrace any longer. You have no right to refuse the divorce and the settlement. Pressured by his father, Michael reluctantly signed the divorce papers. After that, my in-laws apologized to us profusely and took Michael away, almost dragging him. The next day, I submitted the divorce papers to the court. I also contacted Michael's company to report his suspected misuse of company funds. Soon after, his misdeeds came to light, and he was apparently fired. To pay the settlement, child support and restitution to the company, Michael had to sell his house. Now he's working as a living construction worker from morning till night. I considered reporting this to the police, but in the end, there was no evidence other than what Michael had written in his diary. So I decided to be grateful that, thanks to Emma and Alexander, the incident was prevented. Now I'm back at my parents' home, living a peaceful life with Alexander. Sophia and Emma come to visit Alexander almost every day. Alexander says he's happy to be with mommy all the time. Emma told me this, and it put my mind at ease. I wonder if there is a way of communicating that only Emma and Alexander understand. And is it something that adults can't grasp? While pondering these thoughts, I look at Alexander's joyful smile and vow to continue pouring my love into him and protecting him with my own hands. I'm Sally, and my husband Tommy and I used to work at the same place. Tommy, who is two years older than me, was my senior at work. We became close when we ended up on the same project team a few years later and started dating soon after. Two years into our relationship, we got married. After our daughter was born, I decided to quit my job. I loved my work, but my mother-in-law told Tommy that it was strange for a daughter-in-law to be working. So Tommy asked me to focus on household chores instead. From then on, I became a stay-at-home mom. We had our occasional fights, but overall we lived a peaceful and happy life. Then one day, when our daughter was in elementary school, Tommy came home from work in the middle of the day. This was unusual, so I asked him what happened. It happened so suddenly that I asked him what was going on, and he answered, Not only was the job hard, but I was also being harassed by my boss, which caused me to become depressed. I consulted with the doctor at the hospital. I quit my job because someone told me I should quit. When I pressed for details, he explained, my job was tough, and I was also facing harassment from my boss. I've been diagnosed with depression. The doctor advised me to quit, so I did. He also told me, I don't want you to have any more contact with anyone of the company. I felt so bad for not realizing that Tommy was so traumatized. It was really heartbreaking that Tommy was in so much pain and he couldn't notice. I felt terrible for not noticing how much he was struggling. I thought it would be best for Tommy to take some time off to recover. Our income took a hit, but I believed we could manage with some budgeting and my savings from before we got married. Above all else, I thought it was important that Tommy recover mentally and be able to return to society. However, six months passed and Tommy's condition didn't improve. We started using my savings to cover his medical expenses. I decided to take up a part-time job to help out. I thought that once Tommy returned to work, I could save my part-time earnings. Our daughter was now old enough to help with chores, which was a big relief. I did my best to take care of housework and work to the best of my ability so as to not burden Tommy but Tommy's depression didn't get better. Of course, I knew it wouldn't heal that quickly. He would go to the clinic during the day and come back in the evening, only to laze around in the house. 
He seemed fine when talking and eating, so it was hard to tell if he was improving. I suggested trying a different clinic, but he said he was fine with the current one. Just stay as you are, was all he said. I once saw Tommy watching TV and laughing, so I asked, Maybe it's time to start looking for a job? His face turned stern. Just thinking about it makes me feel sick and nauseous, he replied. I don't want to force him into work, especially since he's sick. But the financial strain was getting to me, and I started getting annoyed at Tommy's little comments. Even when I rushed home from my part-time job to make dinner, Tommy would sprawl on the sofa and say, Is dinner ready yet? I'm starving. I couldn't help but wonder why I had to rush home from work to cook for Tommy, who had been home all day. After meals, Tommy wouldn't even take his dishes to the sink. Clothes were strewn around the living room and the dishes from the lunch I prepared were still on the table. I was torn between being understanding because Tommy was sick and wanting him to at least do these small things. Then, another problem arose. I came home from work to find my mother-in-law in the house. What are you so surprised about? Can't I visit my own son? She said. I quickly replied, That's not what I meant. She continued. Why didn't you tell me Tommy is depressed? I had no idea. Honestly, what should I say? I had doubts. I wondered, shouldn't Tommy be the one to tell her? As I sighed, she glared at me. You're taking good care of my son, right? If you had been supportive, this wouldn't have happened. Do you understand? She's been like this since we got married, blaming me for everything. If anything happened, it was all my fault. I was subjected to old-fashioned harassment many times. I used to visit the in-laws often, but her constant harassment made me distance myself. Tommy didn't care and let her harass me. But he also didn't mind when I wanted to distance myself from her. Her attitude of indifference worked to my advantage. And even when I told her that I wanted to leave my mother-in-law, she didn't seem to care, saying, Well, it's fine. I was able to open it. For a while, life was peaceful. But now that Tommy is home during weekdays, mother-in-law has been coming over daily. Even though my mother-in-law comes over, she doesn't lift a finger to help. She and Tommy eat the lunch I've prepared, leave their dishes, and just lounge around, making the house even messier. Cleaning has become a real chore. Since my father-in-law passed away, it's just mother-in-law and the in-law's house. At first I thought she might be lonely, so I put up with it. But she eats dinner at our place almost every day, criticizes my cooking, and even blames me for Tommy's depression before leaving. She never contributes to groceries or brings any food. Our income is already tight, and now we have to cover her meals too. It's a tough situation. Stressed out, I decided to talk to my sister-in-law Lucy, who lives near the in-law's house. Lucy is the only reasonable one among them and has always stood up for me when mother-in-law was giving me a hard time. She's smart and articulate so she can easily counter any of mother-in-law's excuses. Mother-in-law doesn't seem to like Lucy much. I told Lucy about the daily visits from mother-in-law, and the next day, she came over after work and scolded mother-in-law for lazing around. Mother-in-law was shocked by Lucy's unexpected arrival and was at a loss for words. Then, the next day after work, she came to my house with me and scolded mother-in-law for being lazy at home. Mother-in-law was surprised by the sudden appearance of Lucy, who didn't know she was here and was quite anxious. I made various excuses, but as usual, she was yelled at, and my mother-in-law's face turned red and couldn't say anything. 
Lucy warned her. Next time you come, Sally will let me know, okay? After that, mother-in-law never visited again. One problem solved, at least. Meanwhile, Tommy was indifferent and unhelpful. Even after mother-in-law stopped coming, he became increasingly lazy. With my dwindling savings and income, it was hard to cover living expenses and rent for three people. I was really struggling. I don't want to force Tommy to work, understanding his illness, but something had to change. I have to somehow get Tommy to work. I suggested changing his psychiatrist, but he wasn't interested. Anywhere I'll go, it'll be the same, he said. I prepared some candidate hospitals and gave them a pamphlet, but they said, You can stay with your current hospital. I offered to go with him, but he still wasn't interested. I started to doubt if Tommy really wanted to get better. My doubts turned into mistrust. First, I called a mental health clinic where Tommy said he was getting treatment. I wanted to know about Tommy's current situation. I found out he had only visited once a year ago and never returned. The next day, I followed him and discovered he was buying lottery tickets instead of going to the clinic. I checked his wallet that night and found a bank statement showing transfers from mother-in-law. It turns out that Tommy's lottery ticket money is given to him by mother-in-law. My mistrust in Tommy grew. I contacted a former colleague to find out why Tommy had quit his job. I had to do it secretly because Tommy had told me not to contact them. What the colleague told me was completely different from Tommy's story. It all started with a big mistake Tommy made at work, which he tried to cover up. However, when Tommy's boss found out, Tommy got scolded and lost his temper. He ended up arguing with his boss and stormed out, resignation letter in hand. Days later, Tommy kept calling the company claiming, This is workplace harassment. You've damaged my mental health. Pay me compensation. The company was quite bothered by this. Of course, the company rejected all of Tommy's demands. Even then, Tommy persisted. When the company's legal advisor reached out to him, Tommy said, the company made me sick. I'll get a medical certificate. And hung up. After that, he suddenly stopped contacting them. I had a hunch about what happened. Most likely, Tommy went to a psychiatrist after saying he'd get a medical certificate, but couldn't get diagnosed with depression, so he couldn't get the certificate. That's probably why he stopped contacting the company. Eventually, he got tired of working. He took advantage of my kindness, lied about going to the hospital, and lived a lazy life. I was beyond angry. I was disgusted. I didn't want to be with Tommy anymore. I planned to get divorce papers the next day after work. But then, I got a call from Lucy. Turns out, Lucy's husband got transferred and they were moving to another state. I've been really grateful to Lucy, so I decided to postpone the divorce until things settled down. Two months later, Lucy moved. I quietly told her I was considering divorce and she said, I'm sorry about my foolish brother and mother. Our family ties may end, but let's remain friends. Around the time Lucy's move was complete, Tommy said, Mom's coming to live with us next month. I asked, What do you mean, coming to visit? Tommy said, No, she's moving in. She'll live with us. Apparently, with Lucy moving, his mom felt lonely. Their old house was getting run down, so she wanted to live with us, and Tommy agreed. Both Tommy and his mom were so selfish that I just said, Oh, okay. Inside, that reached my limit. I was already planning to divorce him, so I decided to act quickly. Just divorcing him wouldn't be enough, considering what he had done. The next day, while Tommy was at his usual lottery ticket spot, I called the movers. 
I signed the contract on the spot and smoothly prepared to leave in secret. I quickly found a new apartment. If mom's coming, we need to tidy up, I said as I hurriedly packed and sent my belongings to my new home. The situation with my mother-in-law moving in was so unexpected that it actually worked in my favor. Nobody suspected what I was planning. Two days before mother-in-law was supposed to arrive, while Tommy was at the lottery ticket stand, I left the divorce papers at home and left with our daughter. Around the time Tommy would be back, he called me in a panic. When I answered, he blurted out, What's going on? Why did you leave so suddenly? I replied, Didn't you see the divorce papers? That's what's going on, Tommy said. Why all of a sudden? Keeping my cool, I said, Did you really think I didn't know? I know everything. Tommy sounded puzzled. What? So I continued, I know why you quit your job. You weren't harassed. You're the one at fault. You've been going to the lottery stand every day instead of a psychiatrist. You didn't get diagnosed with depression, did you? I also know mother-in-law has been sending you money for lottery tickets. You could hear the panic in Tommy's voice. I told him, You've been deceiving me, and you want me to live with a mother-in-law who's been making my life miserable? You're insane. I don't want to be with a man like you anymore so we're getting a divorce. Tommy kept refusing. No, please reconsider. When I said, if you don't agree, I'll hire a lawyer and demand compensation in divorce court. He quickly agreed. Tommy had no job and no income. He probably realized he'd be in a tight spot if I demanded compensation. Later, I went back to get the divorce papers and submitted them before Tommy could change his mind. Mother-in-law hadn't moved in yet, so I was able to divorce without seeing her. After that, I got a lot of calls from mother-in-law. But when I texted Tommy, I'll consult a lawyer, the call stopped. As for Tommy, he and mother-in-law ended up living in an apartment together. They couldn't pay the rent and had to sell the house. Mother-in-law had sold her own house, so they had nowhere to go. They ended up in a cramped old apartment. Tommy, who hadn't worked for over a year and spent all his time on lottery tickets, had no income. Mother-in-law had squandered most of her late husband's inheritance on Tommy's lottery habit, so they were forced to live on her meager pension. As for me, I started a new life with my daughter in a rented apartment. I considered moving back to my parents' house, but that would mean my daughter would have to change schools, so we moved within the same school district. At first, I was uneasy about running into Tommy or mother-in-law, but they moved away quickly, so life became worry-free. Our living expenses dropped, and I was earning more at my part-time job. I could even buy things my daughter wanted. Even at my part-time job, my hard work was appreciated and my salary was better. So I can buy things that my daughter wants. Money isn't everything, but I feel more relaxed now. My daughter and I are living a very happy life. We've been invited to visit Lucy and her husband at their new location. So we're planning a trip. Having received money from Jennifer, I pick up the steaks at the front door. However, there are only three wrapped steaks. While wondering why is that, I go to the dining room and say, Jennifer, it seems like the count is off. There are only three wrapped steaks. Jennifer says, there's no mistake. Did you intend for Nancy to eat even though she's less than a daughter-in-law? She's just standing there wearing an apron and not doing anything. What a presumptuous girl. A small ill slips out for me, which gets drowned out by John's voice saying, Wow, this looks delicious. The story goes back to when we were newlyweds. My husband John and I, Nancy, 
were living happily and harmoniously every day. There was only one issue. John always wants to go back to his family home in the neighborhood every weekend. Until he got married, John had been living with Jennifer at his parents' home. The father-in-law had already passed away by the time John and I got married. If John had moved out of his parents' house after getting married and Jennifer was living alone, I could understand why he would go check on her every weekend. But Jennifer is not living alone now. That's because sister-in-law Linda is living with her. Linda was married, but she got divorced because she and her husband did not get along. She returned to her parents' home almost as soon as her husband moved out after getting married. Therefore, Jennifer is living with Linda. There is nothing to worry about. Moreover, Jennifer is quite a well-known person in the neighborhood. She is a manners instructor at a university and the neighbors call her teacher, respecting her greatly. Therefore, her pride is high. When she tried to keep it a secret that Linda had returned home and told me, please don't tell anyone, I was rather turned off. However, the neighbors don't know this side of Jennifer. The neighbors all think of Jennifer as a calm and gentle manners teacher. Since Jennifer is so well known, there is no way she could feel lonely if left alone. If something were to happen, surely Linda or the neighbors would notice. At first, I didn't understand why John would want to go to his parents' house every weekend. However, once I got used to married life and things settled down, I thought it wouldn't be right to keep avoiding my in-laws forever, so for the first time since getting married, I decided to go with him. If you insist, let's go visit Jennifer, I said. Yay, thank you, John responded. I started to worry if John was too dependent on Jennifer, but bigger issues awaited me at my in-law's home. The first thing that greeted me when I arrived was Jennifer's sarcastic command. You didn't even bring an apron? I had thought I'd probably have to help out with something, but in my family we didn't have the habit of wearing aprons, so I hadn't brought one. I'm sorry, I apologized. Jennifer, looking exasperated, handed me an apron and said, I can't have you coming here thinking you're just a guest. I was in a rush to help out, but Jennifer wouldn't instruct me on what to do. As I wandered around the house, looking for something to help with, Jennifer tapped my shoulder and said, Hey! It was quite a strong tap, and when I turned around, she yelled at me, Even if this is your in-law's house, looking around someone else's home is extremely rude. I completely shrank back and apologized, saying, I I'm sorry, but Jennifer was not forgiving. Stop wandering around and do something, she told me. I reached for the dishes that had piled up in the kitchen. Then she slapped the back of my hand and yelled, I can't have your filth getting on our nice plates and glasses. Don't touch the dishes. Confused and flustered, I thought, then maybe I'll vacuum. I was again slapped on the back of my hand and scolded, are you saying our floors are dirty? At this point, I had no idea what to do. Standing there dumbfounded, I was endlessly criticized by Jennifer. What are you spacing out for? You're such a useless daughter-in-law. When I looked at John with a help me expression, he was just laughing uproariously at a comedy show with Linda, despite seeing how much I was being braided. In the end, my first visit to my in-laws concluded with unceasing harassment from Jennifer, leaving me so drained that I couldn't even eat dinner that night. Of course, I asked John, why didn't you help me when Jennifer was blaming me? John nonchalantly replied, Mom just wants to give you a hard time for now. It's a phase newlyweds go through. It will pass soon. 
showing no intention to help. Despite this, John still wanted to visit his parents' home. Since I didn't want to see Jennifer anymore, I said, just go by yourself. John said, all right, and happily started going back to his parents' home alone on weekends. Although I was amazed by John's dependence on his parents, it wasn't a deal breaker for our marriage. After a few months of this, John told me, you should visit our home at least once a month. Mom is concerned about you. Certainly, since I married John, Jennifer has become my family. I can't avoid her just because I find her difficult. So, I decided to gather my courage and go. John told me, Mom is probably tired of harassing you by now. But that was a complete misunderstanding. This time, I took an apron, but Jennifer still wouldn't let me help with chores. Instead, she yelled, Help out! You're not a guest! And again, John didn't defend me, and he was engrossed in some movie with Linda. Regretting my decision to come, I heard Jennifer say, Let's order steak for lunch. John and Linda were delighted by those words. John said that the steak restaurant Jennifer wanted to order from was quite upscale and delicious. While Jennifer was placing the order, I was looking forward to the steak as well. After a while, the doorbell rang. At least go and receive the order, you're so thoughtless. I was told angrily by Jennifer as she handed me the money. I went to the front door and received the steaks. But there were only three packaged steaks. Wondering why is that, I went to the dining room and said, Jennifer, it looks like the count is wrong. There are only three packaged steaks. Jennifer responded, It's not a mistake. Were you planning to eat even though you're less than a wife to my son? You can't do anything. You're just standing there wearing an apron. How brazen. Ew, was the soft utterance I made. But it was drowned out by John's exclamation. Wow, this looks delicious. Despite there being only three packaged steaks, Linda and even John started eating without any consideration for me. As I felt a deep shock, as if being stabbed through the heart, Jennifer was looking at me with a smirking face and said, Delicious, isn't it? As she ate a slice of steak. For the first time, I knew the sadness of being unable to eat while everyone else was eating. On top of that, my stomach growled loudly, causing Linda to burst into laughter. <laughs> oh, poor Nancy! But if you are less than John's wife, it can't be helped, Linda said. She continued to pity me. How sad, unable to eat such a delicious steak. How sad to be so useless as John's wife. I felt utterly miserable. Once the three of them had finished their steaks, Jennifer then told me, Now go deliver the key that the delivery person dropped. Apparently, it's a long holiday and the steak restaurant is very busy. They had asked if the dropped key could be delivered directly. I took the dropped key, got into the car and began to drive. I felt like crying from the sadness, but I held back my tears and focused on driving. I shouldn't go to my in-laws house anymore, telling myself that it was as simple as that. I delivered the key that the delivery person had dropped to the steak restaurant. When I walked in, it seemed close to closing time, as there were hardly any customers. Welcome, called out the cheerful Chef Richard, to whom I said, here, this is the dropped key, and I handed it over. Richard, who looked like a kind person, smiled and asked, did you enjoy the steak? At that moment, I didn't know what to say. I didn't want to say it was delicious when I hadn't even eaten it. I opened my mouth to say something, but couldn't. Sensing something was wrong, even chef's wife Karen asked, What's the matter? 
As I tried to speak, tears started to flow and Richard said, just sit down there, prompting me to take a seat. Karen offered me a towel. Touched by the kindness of Richard and Karen, I said through my tears, the truth is, I'm less than John's wife, so I couldn't eat the steak, I'm sorry. My desperate words seemed to surprise both Richard and Karen. Richard said, You're Nancy, right? The wife of the teacher's son, John. I thought you, the teacher, and the John had eaten the steak. Upon hearing this, I first shared the news that Linda had moved back home. I also mentioned that Jennifer was embarrassed by Linda moving back and was trying to keep it a secret. I'm sorry, I was actually told to keep this quiet. Please keep it a secret, I said, crying. Richard and Karen looked at each other and nodded. It's okay, Nancy. Next time you go to your in-laws, order the steak again. Then I'll find a way to help you out. Richard had a stern look on his face, but he smiled gently and said, don't worry. For the first time, I felt like I had found an ally. Another week passed, and when the weekend arrived, John suggested, let's go to my parents' house. Sure, mom is mean to you, but that's her way of showing affection, he said, trying to make sense of it. Given the promise I had with Richard, I decided to show up at my in-law's house. There, Jennifer and Linda greeted me with smirks. Linda said, Did you eat a big breakfast today? It would be embarrassing if your stomach growled again. And laughed. When I weakly replied, I'm fine. Linda laughed at me as if mocking me. And Jennifer, again not allowing me to help with anything, kept scolding me, help out, do something. My head started to hurt every time I visited my in-laws. Lost in thought, wondering if it was stress, Jennifer once again suggested, shall we order steak? She must have gained confidence from the last incident. Glancing at me, she said, of course, for the three of us. And I returned a wry smile. Jennifer began to make a call to the steak restaurant, but her expression gradually darkened. She covered the phone and said, the delivery person suddenly fell ill, so they can't deliver. However, John and Linda still wanted to eat steak, so it was decided to go to the restaurant. Wanting to hide Linda, Jennifer seemed troubled but eventually agreed to be seated in a private room on the second floor. Naturally, I was the one who had to drive. Linda was laid back, but Jennifer, pushing Linda's back, was adamant about not showing Linda to the neighbors, urging her, hurry, hurry. Upon arriving at the steak restaurant, Jennifer told me, Nancy, wait in the car and left me there. John and Linda naturally got out of the car and headed into the steak restaurant. I sighed and started scrolling through my phone. Richard had said, leave it to me. But what exactly is he planning to do? While I was lost in thought, there was a knock on my car window. Startled, I looked over to see the panicked John, who said, Ma Mommy's in danger! Can you come to the restaurant right now? Jennifer is also quite old. Something might have happened, I thought, and hurriedly entered the steak restaurant. Inside the packed restaurant, Jennifer and Richard were arguing over the counter. That's what I'm saying. I see no obligation to serve our steak to Jennifer, who keeps harassing Nancy. Richard, who was shouting, noticed me standing dumbfounded at the entrance of the restaurant and said, Ah, Nancy, come on in. As I timidly approached the counter, Karen handed me a plate of steak. Huh? Why does only Nancy get steak and not us, her family? This is ridiculous. Mom is right. We went through the trouble of coming all the way to the restaurant. Jennifer and Linda created a racket. Richard, with his arms crossed, yelled back, the fact that you came to the restaurant has nothing to do with it. 
You ate steak right in front of her, hurting Nancy's feelings. We have no steak for people with such character. As Richard spoke, some customers also started jeering. That's right, how dare you say that after what you've done? Jennifer and Linda left the restaurant with their faces red, leaving behind a bewildered John. I looked at the steak in front of me and asked Richard, Is this okay? Of course, Richard replied. The steak I ate, after thanking him, was so delicious that it brought tears to my eyes. The encouragement from other customers as I ate my steak in tears was also heartwarming. Just as I was about to pay, I realized that I had left my bag in the car. It seemed that Jennifer and her group had taken the car and left. So I told Richard that I'd pay next time. Richard said, don't worry about the money, and even arranged a taxi for me to go home. I didn't know how to thank him enough, so I thanked Richard repeatedly. If you ever need help, come anytime. I'll take care of Jennifer for you. His reassuring smile saved me. After that, I woke up, thanks to Richard's help. I lost all affection for John, who not only failed to help me when I was being harassed, but also left me at the steak restaurant. When I said I want a divorce and presented the divorce papers, John seemed genuinely clueless as to why this was happening. I blamed him for not helping me when Jennifer was harassing me, but John made excuses, saying, Mom was just lonely because she thought she was losing me. I didn't want to hear such excuses anymore. After a heated argument, we decided to divorce. John moved out and returned to his beloved parents' home. From then on, taking Richard up on his offer of come whenever you're in trouble, I started working at his steak restaurant. People said, you're the one who was married to that teacher's son, right? And told me what had happened to my former in-laws. Apparently, Jennifer had fought with Richard at the steak restaurant, gained a bad reputation and was now ostracized by her neighbors. Even the existence of the returned John and Linda was exposed and they seemed to be the talk of the town as maybe something's wrong with that family. For the prideful Jennifer, this must be tough. John and Linda, who were whispered about whenever they walked outside, seemed to have stopped going out much. It felt somewhat relieving to think that Jennifer is probably taking diligent care of almost reclusive John and Linda. I have had enough of marriage. I'm working here to repay Richard's kindness, but eventually I plan to become a full-time employee somewhere and enjoy life on my own. Looks like you're headed for the great beyond tomorrow, just as planned. I froze when I heard a woman's laugh and voice I didn't recognize. The voice was coming from my husband Nicholas's phone. Right now, he's in the shower. Our four-year-old daughter Margaret happened to be nearby when his phone rang. She touched it and not knowing any better turned on the speaker. The woman, assuming my husband had picked up, kept talking. With this, we'll get the insurance money, and finally we can be a real couple. I got a bad feeling, a real sense of dread. That's when I discovered the terrible secret plan my husband had been hiding. My name is Sophie. I'm 32 and work in an office. I've been married to Nicholas for five years, who is three years older than me, and a company employee. Together with Margaret, we are a family of three. Nicholas is a doting father. Margaret adores him and always clings to him. Every time I saw this, it filled me with joy. I always wanted to cherish the time spent as a family, so I'd adjust my work schedule to coincide with Nicholas's days off. We'd go shopping, visit the aquarium, or go to the zoo. Margaret was looking forward to those days as well. However, three months ago, things changed. 
You don't need to match your days off with me anymore. Work's gotten busy. What? But Margaret looks forward to spending time with you. It can be helped. Nicholas yelled at me and left the house without saying another word. He didn't come back that day. Seeing this sudden change in his normally calm demeanor puzzled me. After that day, he started coming home late due to overtime, and the number of sudden business trips increased. And whenever he came back from those trips, his wedding ring was conspicuously missing. For some reason, he also seemed eager to take a shower right away. One day, Nicholas says to me, How about we take a day off next week and spend some time together? Just the two of us. That's unusual, I thought, but it turns out I'm also off work that day. Come to think of it, since Margaret was born, Nicholas and I haven't had any alone time. He tells me he's already arranged for Margaret to stay at my in-laws' house, so I happily agree. We could go for a drive to the beach, he suggests, and I can't help but look forward to that day. Then, the day before our date comes around, for some reason Nicholas takes a shower as soon as he gets home. Normally, he takes his phone with him everywhere, even to the bathroom. But today, he left it on the table. While I'm cooking, his phone starts to ring. As I'm drying my hands, Margaret picks up the phone and puts it on speaker. Everything's set for tomorrow. He'll be out of the picture. A mysterious woman's voice fills the air. Stunned by her words, I keep listening. She seems to think Nicholas picked up and continues talking. With this, the insurance money will be ours and finally we can... Who is that, Auntie? A friend of Dad's? Hearing Margaret's voice, the woman hurriedly hangs up. Margaret tilts her head. What was that? Maybe it's a friend of Dad's. Let's tell him. Okay. Margaret runs off towards the bathroom with a smile. I guess she wants to tell her dad as soon as possible. In the meantime, his phone is left on the table. Just as I'm about to snoop through it, I hear the bathroom door open and quickly put the phone back in its place. Margaret informs a freshly showered Nicholas, Dad, your friend called! Suddenly, Nicholas rushes into the living room, his body still wet. Did you answer my phone without asking? No, Margaret picked up, but I didn't listen. I see. His stern face relaxes suddenly. His brow smooths. Is he cheating? And what was that about? Out of the picture. That night, unable to shake my suspicions, I wait until Margaret and Nicholas are asleep. Then I check his phone again. The caller ID reads Eric. There are several calls from this Eric, but the voice was unmistakably a woman's. When I open WhatsApp, there's frequent communication with a woman named Caroline. Reading the content, it's clear that Eric is probably a cover, and it's really Caroline. In the messages I found on his phone, there were details about the sinister plan the woman had just mentioned. I was so shocked, I caught my breath. Who is this woman? I can't believe it. Fuming, I clenched my trembling hands tightly. Further investigation of his phone gallery revealed multiple selfies of Caroline cozying up to Nicholas. The woman in these pictures, attached to Nicholas like glue, looked familiar. Is this woman... could it be... When I checked my work computer, it turns out she was someone I knew. So that's how it is. After transferring all the evidence to my computer, I found some important documents in Nicholas's carry-on bag. If you're up for this, be prepared. I've got plenty to corner you both. I then made a call to someone. I didn't sleep a wink that night, and morning eventually came. As I prepared breakfast... 
Nicholas, unusually up early and in high spirits, said, "Great weather for a drive, huh?" "Sure is," I replied with a fake smile, but he didn't seem to notice my mood. "All right, let's get moving." After dropping Margaret off at my in-laws' house, Nicholas started driving. Today, Nicholas was unusually chatty, rambling on about trivial matters. As I played along, my phone rang about thirty minutes into the trip. It's a call from your mom. Margaret seems to have a fever. We need to go back. What? I mean, we asked mom to watch her. She should handle it. Mom says she has a fever close to 102 degrees Fahrenheit and wants to take her to the hospital. I have the medical insurance card, so we need to go back. All right, fine. Nicholas reluctantly made a U-turn. When we arrived at my in-laws' house, Nicholas energetically opened the door to be greeted by a surprised-looking Sasha, my mother-in-law. Mom, how's Margaret's fever? What are you talking about? You called Sophie's phone earlier, right? I did. I never made such a call. Confused, Nicholas and Sasha were at a loss for words, but Nicholas quickly turned to confront me. Hey, what's going on? Fully expecting this question, I flashed a big smile and told Nicholas, "Ah, that was a lie to bring you back here." What? But the phone rang, didn't it? That was just an alarm. I set the ringtone and the alarm tone to be the same to make you believe that a call had come in. Just then, we heard, "Daddy, mommy!" and Margaret came running down the hall, hugging Nicholas around his legs. Nicholas glares at me, not even glancing at Margaret. "Explain yourself." Oh, just returning the favor for all the lies you've told so far. You kidding me? Are you making a fool out of me? Hearing Nicholas's angry shout, a surprised and crying Margaret hides behind me. Sasha, sensing the mood, takes Margaret's hand and says, "Let's read a book upstairs," leading her to the second floor. Standing alone in the entryway. Nicholas just stares at me in silence for a moment. That's when the doorbell rings. Opening the door to our surprise, it's Nicholas's affair partner, Caroline. Caroline, what are you doing here? Nicholas seems utterly flustered. What do you mean? You invited me here to meet your friends and parents-in-law, didn't you? I did. Look, here's the message you sent me. Caroline shows her WhatsApp screen to a puzzled Nicholas. More importantly, why is your wife here? Caroline presses while Nicholas stammers, lost for words. I was the one who invited Caroline, pretending to be you. Hearing my words, both of them looked at me, eyes wide open. What the heck are you thinking? Because I'm not ready to move on to the next world just yet, Nicholas, you were planning something nefarious with me by the sea, weren't you? How do you know about that? Both Nicholas and Caroline seem unsettled, exchanging alarmed glances. They clearly never suspected their plot was exposed. When Margaret answered your phone, I overheard Caroline say. The plan is on, and my wife will be gone tomorrow. Anybody would find that strange upon hearing it. I moved to the living room, sit across the table from the two, and slam printed copies of their WhatsApp conversations and photographs on the table. I have plenty of evidence. How did you get this? Nicholas and Caroline are stunned, staring at the undeniable evidence. Did you forget what I do for a living? You worked some desk job at a company. True, but it's a detective agency. These days, I'm doing more sleuthing than clerical work. At that, Nicholas and Caroline tremble in disbelief, and then I lay out the three hundred thousand life insurance policy under Nicholas's name in front of him. 
I can't believe my own husband was planning to trade my life for money. That's a misunderstanding. What misunderstanding? The entire plan is detailed in those WhatsApp messages. Um, well, you see... Nicholas scrambles for words, trying to make an excuse. I turned to the woman beside me, who was avoiding eye contact, and asked her a question. So, are you pregnant? What? Caroline's eyes darted around as she looked to Nicholas for support. To my surprise, he started defending her. Hey, yes yeah, she is. She's carrying a baby, so don't give her a hard time. That's not fair. Nicholas walked over to Caroline and affectionately rubbed her belly, giving me a glare. That's a lie. What do you mean a lie? I'm five months along. Caroline pointed to a sonogram picture on the table. Look at this. This is proof. The date on that sonogram is ten months old. If it was real, the baby would be born by now. What? What do you mean? Nicholas was watching the exchange between me and Caroline with a puzzled expression. The pregnancy is a lie. Also, did you know she's a scam artist? Nicholas looked shocked. Turns out, Caroline was a scam artist who targeted married men. Her scheme was always the same. Pretend to be pregnant after dating for a while and then extort a large sum of money. I had been involved in a background check for Caroline through work and recognized her face. When I showed the investigative report to Nicholas, he was reading it, gasping. You're kidding me! Nick, all of this is nonsense! Don't listen to her! A panicked Caroline clung to Nicholas, but he forcefully shook her off and sighed deeply. I can trust Sophie because she's never lied to me. Compared to that, I can't believe you're not just lying, but you're also a scam artist. No, Nick, please believe me. Caroline sank to her knees, covering her face with her hands and began to sob as if to gain sympathy. However, even Nicholas seemed to realize he could no longer trust Caroline. Out of the blue, he offered me a sincere apology. Sorry, my bad. Let's start over. I was utterly flabbergasted by Nicholas, who seemed to think an apology would fix everything. I then handed him the divorce papers I had prepared in advance. We can't be a married couple anymore. You'll sign this, right? In the divorce proceedings, I also demanded $30,000 in damages, $20,000 for property division, and $1,000 for monthly child support. Please, don't say that. Reconsider. It's too late for that. The only person I love is you, Sophie. Just as Nicholas was resisting, making all sorts of excuses and hesitating to sign, Margaret came downstairs and ran over him. Dad, do you need help signing? Should Margaret write it for you? Margaret smiled innocently at him. Unable to resist any longer, Nicholas signed the papers without a word. Dad, I signed it well for you. Margaret, who knew nothing of the situation, beamed happily. Sasha noticed the situation and invited Margaret to the park. Full of energy, Margaret said, I'll be going now, and left. I'll also demand $1.5 million from you in the divorce case. I told Caroline, she lost her temper, her face turning red. Why should I have to pay? I'll also be contacting the police about you. Pay for your crime. Caroline's face turned pale and she started to tremble. I can't be caught now. She dashed out of the living room towards the entrance. However, police were already waiting outside and Caroline was immediately arrested. Let go of me! Caroline, whose appearance was far from her shrieks, thrashed about as she was restrained by the police. Nicholas, who had followed her to the entrance, looked drained when he saw what was happening. 
A police officer then tapped Nicholas on the shoulder and said, It's time to go. No way! Why do I have to be arrested? Sophie, help me! Nicholas resisted and struggled, but the burly police officers dragged him into the patrol car and drove off. About 15 minutes later, Sasha and Margaret returned home. Sasha had tears in her eyes and apologized to me, as if she had seen everything from a distance. Turns out, it was Sasha who called the police. When I found out about Nicholas's plan to ruin me with Caroline, I immediately confided in Sasha. Shocked, Sasha said, If that's true, it's my responsibility as a parent to report this to the police. And she agreed to help. That's why she had been keeping an eye on us while entertaining Margaret upstairs. I guess she took Margaret to the park because she couldn't bear to let her granddaughter see her father get arrested. I said, I'm sorry for causing such a commotion and handed Sasha a handkerchief. The next day, I filed for divorce in court. Nicholas and Caroline ended up behind bars. Nicholas sold our home and used the money to pay alimony and child support. Sasha covered the remaining costs, saying, It's the least I could do. The plan was to make Nicholas pay her back once he's out of jail. As for the compensation claimed in the divorce case against Caroline, I plan on having her pay in full once she has served her time. Meanwhile, Margaret and I moved back to my parents' house. Margaret is doted on by my parents, who find her incredibly adorable. I am committed to protecting my sweet Margaret and pouring all my love into her from now on. It's 10 a.m. on a Saturday. Recently, every week around this time, I start to get a headache. All thanks to her. Ah, the doorbell rings, punctually, again, today. I can only watch as my husband happily goes to open the door. I'm home! Just kidding. We're like newlyweds, huh? You're late! Come in! Hey! T! You're so unhelpful! My husband, supporting the woman's shoulder, jeers at me. My precious weekend is always consumed by them. My name is Karen, a 24-year-old working housewife. I work in a general position during weekdays. My husband Mike and his childhood friend Lisa are the same age as me, 24. They grew up in the same town and reconnected at a reunion six months ago. It's clear from his photo albums that they grew up like siblings. What lingers between them is not romance. I can sense that from their interactions. The issue is, Lisa clearly harbors hostility towards me. The story goes back to their student days. Mike liked Lisa since they were children. However, despite his constant attempt, his feelings never bore fruit, and he met me in college. As we took the same classes and started to interact more, Mike naturally distanced himself from Lisa. Then one day, Lisa came to us with a man by her side. She looked at me smugly before saying this to Mike with upturned eyes. We're getting married! I'm sorry, Mike, I couldn't reciprocate your feelings. Her insinuation, as if Mike had settled for me because he couldn't have Lisa, rubbed me the wrong way. However, I decided it wouldn't do any good to make a scene, so I kept quiet. Mike, by the way, can be quite clueless. Even then, that hadn't changed, and he cheerfully told Lisa, Really? Congratulations! Actually, we're planning to get married after graduation, too. Lisa, with her mouth agape, was taken aback by Mike, who didn't even show a hint of sadness. In a way, her reaction was justified. A guy who had always been fond of her suddenly started dating another woman as soon as he entered college, not even giving her a second glance. Moreover, when I declared that I was getting married, it didn't affect Mike at all. From Lisa's perspective, she probably wanted to hear words like, I still love you, or please don't get married, from Mike. Even if there's no romantic feelings involved, it still hurts a woman's pride. Huh? Don't you have anything else to say?
To Lisa's query, Mike responded without any sense of shame. Huh? Something to say. Ah, right! Karen! She's an incredible cook. I've never tasted anything as good as the meals Karen makes. And she's super kind, and she even helps me with my studies. While Lisa glared at me, her fiancé looked back with a puzzled face. I couldn't stand the atmosphere in the room, so I tried to smooth things over. C congratulations on your marriage! I'm glad you both seem so happy. I'll be going now. After saying this hurriedly, I took Mike and escaped. At that time, I thought I had handled the situation well, but to Lisa, my attitude was nothing but a declaration of victory. Ever since then, Lisa had been giving me petty nuisances. Even two years after graduation, every time Lisa came to our house for a visit, she started throwing passive-aggressive remarks. Lisa would only come over on Saturday afternoons when her husband was at work. Of course, Mike never showed any interest in Lisa, but Lisa, on the other hand, would deliberately bring faded love letters from their elementary school days and try to one-up me. Hey, look at this! I found a love letter from Mike when I was cleaning my room! Sometimes, she would laugh insincerely, pretending to be apologetic. Mike and I have a bond stronger than being related by blood or even being a couple. Sorry if this bothers you. We actually had a mutual affection for each other once, you know. You tore us apart, though. If I tried to argue with her, she would look down on me like this. But I get asked out a lot, so I was quickly snatched away by another guy. I don't care, but poor Mike, right? Oops. Did I say something wrong? Mike, without reprimanding Lisa's behavior, nostalgically empathized with her, and they would laugh together. It's fine. Karen understands us well. That was his catchphrase. Of course, I had no intention of accepting their relationship. I've protested to Mike many times. But every time, he would deflect my points like this. As a wife, you should be more relaxed. Don't you trust me? It's sad that you feel like that, being a married couple and all. In the end, it always results in a tense atmosphere and the conversation ends. I was starting to wonder if I could continue to believe in Mike. As autumn approached and the holiday season began, Lisa uttered something outrageous. Hey, let's go on a two-day, one-night hot spring trip to a popular fall foliage spot. Just the three of us. I couldn't believe my ears. A trip together? The three of us? But Mike, true to form, was all for it. Sounds fun. I'll make the reservation. As Mike reached for his cell phone, Lisa stopped him. No need. I figured you'd agree, so I already made the reservation. I can't wait. She had taken the initiative to book the trip on a weekend when both Mike and I were off work. Wait a minute. This is all so sudden. I hurriedly tried to stop it. Lisa, does your husband approve? And isn't it inappropriate to go on a trip with Mike, even if he is a childhood friend? In response to my cautioning, Lisa nonchalantly replied, It's okay, if Karen is there too. From her answer, I inferred that her husband was probably not pleased with the idea. And understandably so. Even though I'm around, she visits her male childhood friend's house almost every week. Let alone an overnight trip? he probably wouldn't easily approve. That night, I tried to convince Mike to cancel the trip, but I was met with, It's too late now. We'd have to pay a cancellation fee. Nothing will happen. Don't worry, as usual. I was talked into it, and the day of the trip arrived. Sorry for the wait. Let's get going, Karen. Upon spotting us, Lisa rushed over with an elated expression. Strangely, during the trip, Lisa didn't try to overshadow me or make suggestive remarks, even once. On the contrary, she was overly friendly, choosing souvenirs with me, taking photos together. Even my husband seemed happy, not having to deal with my irritations. I was a bit let down, as I had assumed that Lisa would link arms with Mike and behave like a couple during the trip. It seemed like my worries were for naught. In this way, we spent the day in harmony. As we were headed to the pre-booked hot spring inn for three, Lisa suddenly turned towards me. I'm sorry! It turns out I couldn't book the lodging properly. 
So Mike and I are in building one, while you, Karen, ended up in building two. Lisa apologized with her hands folded, and Mike, looking surprised, opened his mouth. But we're not sharing a room, right? Mike and Lisa? Then isn't that fine? He easily agreed that it was fine. Aw, oh, Mike, you're getting your hopes up weirdly. Of course we're in separate rooms. Separate rooms. Lisa, who was loudly explaining in an almost high-pitched voice, and Mike, who was laughing without any sense of urgency. The problem wasn't about being in separate rooms, but that they had registered as a pair without explaining anything to us. It ruined the fun mood that had been there until now, and I, Karen, frowned and raised an objection. Hold on a second. Even if you guys are childhood friends, that's just too much. Can't we change the room? Then Lisa shook her head and continued to explain with a dejected face. Due to identity verification, we can't cancel it now. I promise nothing's going on with Mike, so don't worry, okay? To my stunned silence, Mike added fuel to the fire. I've been thinking about this for a while, but can't you stop being jealous of Lisa? Jealous? I'm not- I hate that about you, Karen. It's a hassle for both Lisa and me. At his words, Lisa smirked as if she was victorious. As we passed each other, Lisa whispered in my ear, I'm sorry to leave you all alone. I'm going to have a fun night with Mike, even on your behalf. They left me and strutted off to the inn. I took out my secret weapon hidden in my pocket and took a picture of their backs. I won't forgive them. I'll make them pay. The next morning... At the station where I interacted with them, Lisa was standing in shock with her eyes wide open. Why, why are you here? Standing in front of her was Lisa's husband. His face was filled with anger and he was quietly glaring at his wife. Karen told me where you were. Seems like you're having a lot of fun. I stepped forward in front of Lisa's husband, deeply bowed my head. Thank you for coming all this way today. I sincerely apologize for my husband's actions this time. With fake tears, I held a handkerchief to my eyes. Upon seeing this, he urged me to raise my head. No, it's ultimately my responsibility. Lisa, my wife, is the one at fault. I will divorce her. I will definitely pay you for your troubles. Divorce? What on earth are you talking about? Lisa turned pale as her husband his veins bulging in anger, berated her. I thought it would be okay if we all went on a trip together, including Karen. But it seems I was wrong. I can't continue with you. We're getting a divorce. Hold on a minute. There must be... some mistake. Hear me out. As if to interrupt Lisa's words, I chimed in, matching the rhythm. Me too. Through this incident, I have been able to unveil my husband's true nature. I am also filing for divorce. At that moment, my husband opened his mouth wide and looked at us. What? Divorce? We haven't done anything wrong. At his words, Lisa also started to raise her voice in defense. No, that's right. It's just Karen's misunderstanding. We've been separate the entire time. There's nothing going on between him and me. Lisa quickly tried to link arms with her husband. However, he immediately shook it off and slowly took out his cell phone. It's no use trying to hide it. Can you say the same thing in front of these photos and recordings? He played the recording in front of everyone. I'm sorry for leaving you alone, Karen. I'll spend a fun night with Mike, including your part. Haha. <laughs> what came from the cell phone was unmistakably Lisa's voice. Lisa's voice, which I had secretly recorded when she whispered in my ear. Mike was astounded by the recording and started yelling at Lisa. Lisa! You said this to Karen? I interrupted Mike's yelling and showed a different piece of evidence. Two people walking arm in arm towards a hotel in a town under the twilight. Anyone who saw it wouldn't hesitate to think, these two are having an affair. A stitch in time saves nine. From the beginning, I had not trusted Lisa and had preserved evidence in crucial scenes. Anyway, I had set a condition before this trip. That was, if Mike didn't protect me from Lisa, 
We would definitely get a divorce this time. What they did was not strictly an affair. It may have been mean to collect evidence that hinted at an affair and send it to Lisa's husband. But I, too, have been constantly undermined by Lisa. There must be something during a trip with three people. Then I'll have to take measures as well. I thought this was the only chance to have her husband intervene and punish Lisa. Soon, Mike started to make excuses in an agitated manner. K karen It's a misunderstanding! We were just heading to the inn together! Shut up! How many times do you think I've warned you about Lisa? I recalled how happily he had welcomed Lisa into our home. How he had repeatedly clashed with me for not welcoming her. How he had accepted staying in the same inn as Lisa without objection. And how he had brushed off my feelings as jealousy. As I started to throw all my piled up resentments at Mike, he seemed to have realized that he was in the wrong. Without caring about the surroundings, he prostrated himself on the spot. I'm sorry. I'll stop seeing Lisa. But please, don't divorce me. Surprised by his sudden behavior, I listened to my continue. I don't love Lisa or anything like that anymore. She's just a friend. His words seemed to have shocked her. Even if her husband divorced her, she could eventually get together with Mike. Maybe that's what Lisa was thinking. After all, she was a housewife and also a lady from a slightly good family, so she didn't have any work experience. She probably figured that if she lost her current husband, Mike was the only one left who seemed likely to marry her. That's why she was weighing her husband Mike against her as insurance. I understand what you're saying. At my words, Mike lifted his head and showed a bright expression. But regardless of whether or not you've cheated, I'm going to divorce you. I just can't stand your attitude. It's the worst. But, Karen, that's harsh. Who's the harsh one here? I found myself shouting. Mike, you fell right into Lisa's scheme. You intended to ostracize me from the start and stay with you in the same inn. I would have forgiven you if you had rejected her, but instead, you sided with Lisa. Have you ever considered how I felt being left alone during the trip? I'm sorry, Karen. I'm really sorry. He seemed deeply affected by my stern approach. Mike slumped down, head hanging low. Then, why did it have to turn out this way? Lisa began to cry, sitting on the road. It's a misunderstanding. Mike and I are like siblings. It's all because of Karen's jealousy. J jealousy Finding her words ridiculous, I glared at Lisa in a provocative way. Who's been behaving in a way that stokes jealousy all this while? The moment Mike was taken from you, you started approaching him. Despite being a married woman, your behavior is low. But I was just... You just want to be fawned over by various men. You were upset when Mike's affections, which were once directed towards you, turned towards me. It's because of your behavior that your husband is fed up with you. Reflect on your actions, you trashy woman. Ugh, that's harsh. Crying won't help. After all, I'm a woman. Maybe you should ask your beloved Mike for help. Bye, Mike. See you. I got into Lisa's husband's car and went home, leaving the two behind. I had originally taken the train to the trip. They can go anywhere together for all I care. Lisa's breakdown looked pathetic, but I finally felt relieved. It seems that my personality is not as good as I thought. After returning home, I filled out the divorce papers, placed them on the table, and went back to my parents' house. I ignored all the incoming calls and emails from Mike. It seems that Lisa happily got divorced. I heard that Lisa and Mike were blaming each other for the divorce, and their friendship had collapsed. Since I've cut off all contact, I'm not sure what happened to them. As for me, I switched to working from home, and now I'm working comfortably without anyone bothering me. I'd rather not get married for a while, especially to a man with a childhood female friend.